think anybody will, will get bored uh, through the rest of our year. Okay, now, um, our speaker today uh, is a neighbor, a good friend, um, Rosa Gooch, uh, and, and she has a special story to tell. And it's a story about a young girl caught up in the chaos that was World War II. Um, she'll take you from the, the pastoral, peaceful life of a, a small farm in, in southern Russia uh, through a uh, forced labor camp uh, of Nazi Germany. Uh, it's a tale of hardship, uh, cruelty, uh, but also of perseverance and faith. Rosa, welcome. daughter that asked me to speak I say I'm too old I, it's been a long time ago I spoke so my brain is not working like it used to be <laughs> I am uh, 87 year old so and uh, who this age know how you feel <laughs> I always like to tell a little joke, you know. It's really true, some. When I was living in Russia and I was a little girl, every day, every day I have to stand in a line for bread. And uh, when Gorbachev became president of Russian country, he promised perestroika, that means change everything. But he don't change. People still standing in a line for bread. And so there was a big, huge line. And the one man, he say, well, he say, I'm so mad at the garbage show because every day we still have to stand in a line for bread. He say, I go home and get a gun and I'm going to go and kill Gorbachev. And everybody was happy. Oh, good. So he left. But 20 minutes later, he came. And all the people from that line running to him. And what happened? He said, oh, God, there is bigger line than over here. <laughs> This is my father. <clears throat> he is, uh, he been in the Navy. And after he finished Navy, he come home. And you know, before he come to Navy, this man, he don't know how to write, how to read, because in the time, there was Tsar and no school for children. So he don't know anything. But when he returned back from the Navy, he was a really smart man. He know how to write, to read. And this is how my mother, my mom never can write, no reading, nothing. So when she have to uh, put signature, she just make an X. So my father, when he came from the Navy, he said, well, I'm going to look for a job. And where my mother was living, there was all coal mine city. And he came there to look for a job, he found, and he started. He worked in coal mine, and my mom's father, he works there too. So in the lunchtime, my mom 
bring, when she was a little girl, she bring the lunch to her father. And my father, Simeon Ivanovich, his name Simeon Ivanovich Samarsky. He saw this little girl and he really liked her. And he said, when she left, he said to her father, may I come sometime and visit you? And, my, and her father said, sure, anytime. My mom was 14 year old and my father was 25. And they met each other and uh, her father gave permission to get married and they got married. So my father, there in that city, there was no places to lay, so you have to build house or anything. But he don't have any money. So the government gave uh, the ground to the people so much you want. So he gave him place to build. So my father built a barn, big, huge barn, and insulated inside with mineral, clay, and straw mixed together and put it on the wall. And then he bought big, huge coal stove in the middle and, and built uh, some wood beds. They don't have any kids yet. And so he's ready. And so they moved there in and they laid there. And um, after years, my mom started having the children. And she had six boys and four girls. So my mom had 10 children. In the time that I was born, my father worked in the night till 12 o'clock night in the coal mine. <clears throat> and this time was winter and uh, snowing, blowing, drifting. You cannot see any highway, nothing. There was no highway really. And my mom put kerosene light outside by the barn so when he come back so he can see where his place is. My mom sat by the coal stove and uh, she started having attraction. And when my father came in, she said, honey, he said, she said, you have to bring me to the hospital. I'm going to have a baby. He said, no, this weather, well, there's nothing to do. Baby's gonna come. So my father had big sled he made for the children and he put blankets on and put my mom on it and cover her and he pulled the sled to the hospital and first he had to go down the hill over the frozen river and, uh, and then up the hill and he made it just in time. My mom go in the hospital, they put it on the, and baby came and that was uh, Rosa. <laughs> so um, I'm growing up there and uh, <clears throat> the school, just like here in America, kids go to school and uh, but teaching is different. Uh, in our schools, we cannot say, well, I'm going to take this geography of algebra of this. No, over there you have to take everything what government say. You have to take everything. But in school they teach there is no God like in other countries. So what God I don't know anything. <clears throat> Only I know about Lenin. You know when we come to school First thing what we do, we have to sing the song for Lenin because he's dead. And uh, well, we were not happy with, it, with Lenin and we were really afraid to say anything because sometimes people say something and they disappeared. 
and nobody know what happened to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to ask Stalin what he do because he killed million, million, billion people in there. <clears throat> when I was a little girl, my grandmother come over to visit us, stay a couple days, and she take me on her lap and she start telling me about Jesus Christ. I never heard that before, but she told me some things. And I feel like grandmother plant seed in my heart. And uh, I become so close to Jesus Christ. I never read Bible, never seen church of anything, but I had, I become so close that I hide some places and I talk to Jesus, you know. Sometimes I look through the window, I see the moon, and I think I see Jesus' face and I talk to him. So that's why I become real close. <clears throat> the Russian country was really poor. I tell you, I never had pair shoes on my feet. In the winter time, my mom make a quilt, quilting, and um, she made a boot. And then my father take galoshes from my, from my brothers and he cut that bag that wear off and he glued together and this is what I wear to school. I had only one dress and uh, when I come home from school, I wear something old for my brothers. And so that was my life and my feet become so tough that I can break uh, stickers in the field and don't hurt. <laughs> My mom and I, we work very hard. I was a little girl and I work from little girl off. I know that we don't have any water to drink there and I have to go about three miles one way and three miles back. I have this wooden thing on my shoulders and two big buckets full. And we go to the mountains and this is where the water, clear, clean water runs. Filled up the buckets and I bring home. And I really learn how to walk like the Japanese people, you know. <laughs> I don't spill any drip water till I come home, my buckets is full. And this is a hard job for a little girl. I was not even 10 year old when I have to do this. But then to water a garden, we have a river down and we, have, we had big wagon with the big wheels and have three big barrels on it and we go down and fill it up and my mother pull like a horse and I push, you know, and we water a garden. And we have guarded uh, by the river too. We have to raise our food because when you go to the store, the, there is nothing to buy. There is nothing. You have to have your own food to raise. And whole summer, uh, we have vacation from school and we work really hard to, uh, to raise the everything, corn, beans, potatoes, and cabbage, and all kinds of stuff, everything for the winter. When uh, one time there was start, they gave in coupons, and a number every day in the newspaper say, this number is loaf of bread, this number is butter of sugar and you go to the store and you get it and people was afraid what's going on you know and uh, no nothing but I guess in a short time the war start between Germans and the Russian and the Russian they're not prepared for this war so uh, and Germans taking over so fast, city by city, you know, I, I have to jump shorter because when I have to talk about everything, then take me two hours. 
<laughs> anyway, and they come close to our city. And that was really bad, the fighting so bad, and uh, take over. And uh, my father plant big orchard, all kind of fruit, and uh, they come in with the, with the tanks and the horses and whatever they have. And they cut the trees and I camouflage the tank with the trees, you know. And I can see my father standing there and the tears falling down. He had this orchard plant years ago and we had fruit. fruit. We had chicken, they grabbed the chicken, the butcher and the cook, and uh, <coughs> come in the house and uh, anything we have, they take it. Even starch, uh, taking the girl, young girls and raping them. It's so terrible. <coughs> so when the, when the Russian left the city, they don't want to leave anything for Germans, you know. The coal mine, we had the best coal in this city there. And uh, the Russian put gasoline on the coal and make a fire so it's burned. And so the Germans take children and we have to dig between so that we can save coal that don't burn everything. And I was working whole week and it's so hot, it was in the summertime. Then, <clears throat> then I say to my mom and dad, I say, well, maybe they leave me alone though. Uh, I don't have to work. And one night, somebody knocked on the door and my mom opened the door and there was two uh, soldiers, German soldiers. And they say, where is your daughter? My mom says, she's sleeping. He say, uh, I want to tell you that you have to get her ready. In the morning, we're picking up her and many other kids, and we're taking them to Germany to work, to work there. And my mother started crying. My mom say, she's 14 years old. You cannot take her. He say, yeah, we need people to work. So. <clears throat> My sister came and my mom and they fixed what I had and they fixed the chicken for me to take. And in the morning early, the Germans came with the horses and the wagon and the takers and we have to go from our city to another city. I don't know how many miles, maybe 10, maybe 15, I don't know. But that was in November was snow blowing and cold and uh, uh, my father he say I walk with you a little while and he walked with me and I start uh, snow blowing and you don't see where you walk you know and I say to my father well you better go back because the drift the, the highway drifting you cannot see where you're gonna go and my father he uh, he said, well, I'm going to tell you goodbye, he said, and, and uh, he said, when you're still alive, when it's war over, please come back home. I say, yeah, I was daddy's little girl, and uh, I promised my dad that I come back home. So I say, daddy, you better go. He had the mustache, and I sick of hanging. And the, and the mustache was so snowing and freezing, you know. And I kissed my father goodbye, and he left. And so I look backwards every time, and I see till I don't see the spot of him. That's the last time I, uh, I seen him. So they bring us to the other city. We came there, and they put us in a big, just like a barn, big building and uh, they say you have to wait there till tomorrow and it was so cold you know you stamp the feet to keep the water and and in the morning I thought well the train come and uh, we're gonna be nice and warm inside no in the morning they say come on everybody and we go and there was cars where the animals 
bringing from one city to the other, the straw in it, and of, oh, but 25 boys and girls all together in one car, and they lock the door, and this way we have to go. And they never feed us, the, that's the only thing what we had. And sometimes they stop, and they gave us bucket snow, dirty snow, to drink. That's all what we had, and terrible, and it's cold inside. And so they take us about five or six days. She came to Warsaw, and in Warsaw we have to go through the doctors that we don't bring any sickness of what. They put all the clothes in this kind of machine, uh, so much degrees, so they kill things, bacteria, all the stuff, and then they take us and they brought us in Berlin. And then Berlin, they put us in the barracks, and then we stay there, sleep on the floors, and the next day they bring us outside and put us in the line, and people come and buy us, the factory people. So the one old man, he came and he bought me and uh, one girl from uh, our city. And I say to the girl, I say, oh, I bet you he's farmer. He don't need too many girls, so he batches too. Oh, that's fine. I say, I'd be happy to be on a farm. You have something to eat there. So we came and he brought us in another city and uh, there is little factory. And he brought us there to show us what we have to do the next day. And that was, we making the handrails and some kind, uh, some kind small things and machine working. And so then he take us back and we walked about maybe <clears throat> three, four miles out of city and there is mountains, and there is six barracks in the mountains, and the gate locked, he rang the bell, and a guy came, opened the gate, and they take us inside. So then he gave us mattress filled with the straw, and pillow with the straw, and two real thin blankets, and take us inside in the barrack, and uh, windows was frozen, no heat inside, and uh, the other girls, they are working still, and so <clears throat> we wait, and the other girls came, and we say, uh, don't you have a heat here? Oh no, they say, we get only a little cold on Sunday, but not in the, in the, in the week. So they go to the kitchen to get the f supper, and I was so hungry, so hungry. I go there too. <clears throat> they had to get a pop bowl, big bowl, and uh, scooping something I don't know, I don't see too well there, and uh, in the bowl. And I came there with my bowl, and he said, no, you don't work today. You don't get nothing to eat. So I go back to barrack and I was cold, freezing. So I crawl over in bed and cover myself and shaking from the cold and, and stomach hurt from hungry. And so in the morning, five o'clock, wake up. We have to start seven. Wake up, get ready to go eat breakfast and go to work. <clears throat> so I go to breakfast, first one. I get sliced bread, real thin, it's nothing on the bread, and a big dish black coffee. No sugar, no milk, nothing. That's a breakfast. And I thought <clears throat> there was a big table and a slice of bread laying. I, I wanted to take one more. He said, no, one, one, that's all. So I thought, oh boy, that one piece of bread just swung the and there we get supper, and then I know what we get. Big bowl, the cook turnips in the water, and you get a big, huge bowl, and this is all. And nothing in the water, just clear water and turnips. 
And ladies and gentlemen, that's what I eat for three years, every day, and work hard. And sometimes you get beatings you don't obey when they tell you what to do. On Saturday we work till one, and then 180 girls have to shower and wash your clothes from one o'clock afternoon till six o'clock evening. And sometime I'm in the shower and I have soap on me and the lady come out, out. I say, I still have soap. And she come and hitting me on my head, you know, out. So I get out, I still have soap. So I wipe it off and that's the way it is. You have to obey her, you know. And uh, it was terrible. I had long hair and a full with lies. You get one time in a week that you can take a shower and sometimes you get half shower and half washing your hair. So uh, after this three years, they put a note in the barracks when one girl escape, we just gonna shoot them. We're not gonna put it up with them. And this is when I feeling that I need to do something because I was so skinny, bone and skin. I can hardly walk to work. And I thought I have to do something. I'm not living and I'm not dying. So I say to the girl that from a city, I say, you know what? I think I, I try to escape. Oh, she say, no, don't do it. They're gonna kill you. I say, well, they kill me, then I'm not suffering like that. And uh, <clears throat> then I, uh, like I told you that my grandma told me about Jesus. And I become so close. The Saturday night, I pray all night in bed so that he can help me to escape from this slave labor camp. So I, uh, early in the morning on Sunday, I wake up, I dig the big hole under the barbed wire fence, and I put boards on it and cover it with sand so nobody see there was a hole. And then a little bit later, I told my, my friend goodbye. I said, will you close this hole when I leave so nobody see that somebody was left there? So she covered that hole and nobody knew that I was gone. This she told me later when I was gone to Russia. Uh, so I left. I was so scared. I had faith in Jesus Christ, but I was so scared that I can feel my heart beat in my heels. The first thing, I don't know where I'm gonna go. German language was not so great, still, so, and I walked. I walked at the city, I was in the field. All field, I walk on the highway, and I can feel that Jesus Christ guiding me. He guided me to a little tiny house in the field, and there was a lady working in the yard. And I walked to her and I say, hi, you have anything to eat for me? She say, sure, come in. So I go inside with her, she fed me, and she say, no, you have to go back where you come from. And I start crying. I say, I cannot go back because they're going to kill me. I escaped from slave labor camp. She said, oh, I like to keep you here, but I'm not a farmer. I cannot have you here. So <clears throat> she said, you stay with me, and I find a farmer, and I bring you there. So I stay with that lady, and I had lies. So I told her that I have lies. I don't want to go in bed, and all the lies go in bed. So I said, cut my hair off. So she cut my hair off, put medication, and all the lies fall out next day. So that feels so good. Can you imagine working on a machine in a factory, 
and oil and you feel the lies digging in your skin and you put your hands in it and you got them up in the oil. Anyway, that feels so good when it's all clean up. So at noon time, she say, you go lay down and rest. You sick, you so skinny, you go lay down. So I go lay down and she leave, lock the door and she go looking for the farmer. <clears throat> and this was for three days. The third day, she find the farm, <laughs> she come back and she start crying. I say, what happened? She say, oh, I find the farmer, he wants you. I, I, she say, but I wish I can keep you here. So uh, she brought me over there on the farm. When she returned back, there was two policemen on the door looking for me. And uh, they say, you have a Russian girl here. She say, no, I got my niece for a couple of days, but she already gone. So they go in the house and look through whole house. They don't find anything. And so, <clears throat> and on the farm, I changed my name. Uh, I told them I was Maria Brisnova instead of Rosa Samarskaya. And so, and I think when the farmer called Maria, so I be answering. So I'm Maria, so I remember that. And uh, then the next day she came, that lady, and she telling me about this two policemen came. And I say, no, no, I know that Jesus Christ lived. that he guided me on time when the policemen came. And oh, how grateful I was. I had bed, mattress was from the feathers, and a down blanket. I laid down and say, oh, Jesus Christ, that's a heaven here. That's heaven here. And then good food to eat. I eat with the farmer on the same table. But I have to work hard, I tell you. Work like a man. Plowing in the field with the horses. Planting potatoes. Getting out the manure. And sprinkling by hand in the field. Not like no with machines. I milk 16 cows three times a day. Then I milk, I drink some milk, I start gaining weight, looking like a girl. <laughs> and oh, I don't mind, I have to work from five in the morning in the summer till 10 at night. I don't mind how hard work. I have good food to eat and good bed to sleep and I can take a bath, wash myself clean, no more lies in the hair, and no more beatings. So on this farm, I work for one year, and will you believe I save one pilot, American pilot. I had a plane was shot, and he came in a uh, parachute down, I don't speak, in, speak English, but using your hands, you know. I put them in a the barn, in the hay there, and I brought them for three days food to eat. And close to river called Rhine, Rhine River. And there were American there. And so American shooting their side. Oh, once in the morning, and I let you know that you be finishing your cow milking and you better go in the shelters because they're gonna keep shooting. And there is no Germans to fight them back. One day, you know, there was three Dutch boys that escaped from concentration camp and they're working next to us on the farm. 
There was Russian girls working on other farms. So we had all girls and boys together. And uh, one boy from Holland, he kind of liked me, you know. And he told me, he say, when uh, the World War Second over, you like to go to Holland? I say, I don't know yet. Just wait till uh, war finish. And there, he came with the white flag sheet on a pole, running. He said, look at that, look at that. I look, and there are Americans in the tanks coming all in. No German shooting at them. That was so wonderful. They came on a farm in the field, you know, there, and we're running over there, greeting them. Nice looking boys sitting, and first thing I see, everyone was chewing, you know. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was thinking, what the heck, the chewing, the chewing the gum. <laughs> the boys gave in there. And their soldiers, American soldiers, giving boys cigarettes and giving the girls chocolate. And they opened the can and dinner ready, never seen before. That's so wonderful to compare when the Germans came in Russia, what they do. They're hurting everybody, they're beating, they're shooting. Uh, I don't tell so many things what happened there. But anyway, <clears throat> so my boyfriend right away, he was not a boyfriend, just a boy, we know each other, and he said, well, you ready to go to Holland? I said, well, I don't know. And I, then I think, I played about, and I think, I don't want to go to communism country. Right now I have a chance to get away. So there was the other two boys from Holland, and we all have to walk. And Holland was still on the Germans. So the farmer, he was afraid, and he told the, the boy, <clears throat> my boy, he said to him, you take a good care of this girl, he said. And to me, he said, when he don't take care of you, real bad to you, just come back on the farm. So we left. <clears throat> we have to go over the river. Another side is American, uh, the patrol, and there was all co uh, minefields, and the brothers through the minefield. I was so scared, anyway. But before, the one of the boys stole the uh, rowing boat, <clears throat> with a hole in it. We have to scoop the water out to make the other side. Then we go and then we're gonna go walk to Holland. We walked 15 miles. My boyfriend had the blisters on the feet. My feet is still good, you know, they're tough. So I can, I can walk. <laughs> and so then those two boys, they say, you know what, we, they stole bicycles, boat, and they're going to bicycles home. They're going to be tonight in Holland, and uh, they say, and you'll be there tomorrow. <clears throat> now, we walked, and the American Jeep Patrol came and picked us up and brought us to the college building. There are more children there waiting. <clears throat> and uh, they say to me, where you come from? I say, I come from Russia. He say, we have rules to send everybody to their own countries. I say, I don't want to go to communism country. I go with this boy to Holland and someday get married. I was 18 year old. And um, he say, we can marry you here. I say, you know what? I never date any boy. I don't know nothing but marriage. And uh, he said, then we have to send you back home. I cry, I cry, and the next day I say to the boy, I say, <clears throat> okay, I decide to get married. I say, but we're not gonna be as husband and wife. 
just, uh, you know, have relationship out there. No, just like girlfriend and boyfriend. He say, okay, that's okay. I say, Tom, we came in to Holland, and then I know you don't have any girlfriend or wife. And <clears throat> so the American marriage, in five minutes we are done, married. And I say, the papers is not going to be in Holland. But I was wrong. <clears throat> so we still have to wait for uh, uh, the Germans leave Holland. Holland was the richest country in the world. The money was gold. There was no paper money. There was only gold, gold money. And everything disappeared. <laughs> this poor people suffered. You know, when the Germans taking over Holland, the parachutes coming down, Holland don't have any soldiers. And the, pe uh, the people running to the parachutes to see what, what happening, they don't even know what's going on and Germans take over Holland. So Germans left Holland and then we can go there. So we came to Holland, I tell you. <clears throat> My meeting with uh, his folks, that was really hard. I don't speak uh, uh, Netherlands, only German. And uh, so his mother, First thing, what she said to him when they came, when we came, she said, "I never had any money from you." She said, "I know you bringing this girl from a slave labor camp here to take a care of it." And uh, there was aunt in the home. She visit there, and she speak German, and she told me what the mother said. Oh, what a welcome, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and so, and uh, she tell me German language, and she say, I'm leaving, and you are welcome to come anytime to a farm. They had a farm. So I live there with the mother <clears throat> and the father. They have uh, a good-sized home, and... Uh, he was their first son, and they had another boy. And uh, bad life in Holland. There was nothing in the stores yet to buy food. It was terrible. <clears throat> so the mother became uh, <coughs> Miss Queen. And I was slave again. <laughs> I have to do all the things that she tell me to do in this house. And uh, so, and there is no apartments, nothing. Holland, young couple waiting for 10 years to have apartment to get married, you know. And so, <clears throat> uh, I go to the courthouse, I talk to this guy. I say, I like to have some place. I don't care if there is only two rooms. I say, I'm a marriage and I like to have place to lay. And they came to the house and start talking to his mother. And she say, oh, there's plenty of room here, plenty. I like them to stay here. And that's the first baby. I was expecting baby already, eight months. And uh, she say, that's the first my grandchild and I love to have him here. And they told me, well, your mom loves to have you here. She said, plan your room. So we have to give apartments to the other people. And they left. And this girl left too. I go to the farm to the end. And she had living room and a kitchen. And her bedroom upstairs above the above cow barn. She had to go to the cow barn and go on the stairways up. And she put the furniture in the living room to the corner and put my bed there. And this is where baby born at home. 
and the last March, March that beautiful weather, and uh, we clean the barn, cows go in the field, barn clean, put my bed in the barn, and a cradle there, and this is where I slept. And the rats running over my bed in the night. But we had two dogs that chasing them. <laughs> <laughs> so after a couple months, and had some guy in the city, and uh, she brought them, you know, milk and cheese and all that stuff. There is nothing in the stores. And he had an old house. It's a row of apartments, 65 year old. And he gave us one apartment that we can live. It was wonderful <coughs> to start. I have nothing, <coughs> nothing than only bed, two forks, two spoons and a one pot aluminum, that's all, and a baby. And this is how I start living. And I don't know how I make it, I tell you. So later, I was blessed with three girls <clears throat> and three boys. One boy in Holland passed away, died. He was three years old. He got leukemia. So, and then, uh, <laughs> Life is not easy, and my uh, darling husband, I had some feelings, but he was abusive. He beat the children and beat me all the time. So I don't have any families to go and discuss, you know. So then we start uh, deciding to go to America immigrate to America because they're telling us for the wonderful life is there so take us whole year to get the papers ready through the doctors have to have somebody sponsor you with the much money you cannot go like that and finally we left in in the winter time January February and uh, I was sick all the time, boy, seasick, throwing up, lost, lost cup, so many pounds. And uh, <clears throat> one night, 36 hours on the same place, the boat cannot move. And sometime I say to my husband, take me outside, I need fresh air. When he take me outside, I think that's a mountains. No, that's a waves. Oh. And boy, I say, bring me back to bed. <laughs> bring me back to bed. <clears throat> so we made it. And when we, when we made to New York, and I saw the Statue of Liberty, and when I, I take a first step off the boat, I kneeled and kissed, kissed the girl. And I tell you that uh, <clears throat> This is most blessed country in the whole world. I have three daughters been married. I have 27 grandchildren <laughs> and 23 great grandchildren. What <laughs> a wonderful country. And I tell you, there is no one day that I kneel and thank the Lord for this beautiful, blessed country in the world. I get so upset when the people complaining. Yeah. I know I leave Lakewood Beach and airplanes go.
going and going through my yard every day, just like I bought the house. And you know what I do? I have the American flag standing there. When a plane go, this girl take American flag and wave. <laughs> One day I go to Oak Harbor and by the bridge, whole bunch of people standing. And I thought, oh, what is it? They're talking to each other. And I think, let me see. I park my car someplace and I walk. And they were complaining about those airplanes going over the houses. I say, oh, really? I say, I tell you, I thank the Lord, in a, when I was in slave labor camp, see that I, I don't tell everything. I thank the Lord, I say, oh Lord, please let those brothers come in, American, with their planes, the bombing every night there. And the bombing, I tell you, America doesn't know how to bomb. <laughs> <laughs> We stay in the barracks all the time. <coughs> Nothing, no place to run. I, I think they drop the lights and they can see that slave, slaves there, so they don't throw any bombs there. So, and I am, I am so grateful for America, so grateful, like I say, I thank my Lord every day that I am here and that I bring my children here so they can enjoy the life, freedom of the American country. And I am American citizen and I am so thankful to be one. And this is my country I love. And I hope and I pray that all of you Appreciate this beautiful country in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Anybody want to ask anything? Did you get back home to Russia after the war? No, I, uh, yeah, I go in 1967. I don't see my family for um, 20, what I say, yeah, 67. I don't see my family for 27 years. Yeah. And my father was gone. Yeah. What year did you come to America? I came here 59. 59. Do any of your children live here on the island or near here? Yeah, one daughter live outside the Oak Harbor. They have 20 acres. Far. <laughs> and the one daughter live in Everett. Good. In, in the beginning, you mentioned Gorbachev. Did you mean Khrushchev? Oh, no. <laughs> I don't make Khrushchev. Yeah. I'd be taking my shoe and I'm not heading on the table, I'd be heading on his hair. <laughs> yeah. 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 <clears throat> Where was your home? Was it just outside of Moscow? No, my home was uh, uh, by you, uh, close to Ukraine, by the Black Sea, Novoshaftinsk. It's a little city, it's a coal mine city. I always say, <clears throat> I'm a coal mine daughter, <laughs> but I only, you're <laughs> 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 Okay. Oh, I have one question. What did your husband do in this country? What, what was his work here? Well, he, uh, he was an electrician in Holland, but over here you have to have diploma. He has to go to school. We don't have any money. So he, 
uh, that built in, we live in Idaho, Idaho Falls. And uh, he got a job at a new store, Sears, oh. as a janitor. And then later, he, uh, he got a job uh, at the Navy base, Atomic, uh, Atomic, uh, oh, yeah. he had a good job there. Yeah. Good. Yeah. But uh, I divorced him. He beat, he beat me and the kids. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I tell you, then I married, uh, then I married doctor oh. <laughs> who was uh, chasing with other women. <laughs> <laughs> I catch them in bed. Oh. And boy, Russian blood started popping. <laughs> in the night, two o'clock, I catch them. But anyway, then later, <clears throat> then later, I married, uh, I married retired colonel from the Air Force. Oh, and most of the people know him here. He, uh, let's see, he, he's married to his first wife 32 years, and she started chasing with other men, and he was living alone on the Woodby Island for five years, and uh, he had a sister in Idaho, and I was alone. Doctor left me for another woman, and uh, so then we meet each other, and then two months we get married. Good. It's not like teenagers. No. <laughs> and he was Never. wonderful husband. Good. Wonderful. He likes to live in a would be island after we married but too much raining there. And uh, I, I say in Idaho, and then one year that he's gonna sell his home and come, and there was four feet snow on my roof. <laughs> 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 then I decide to sell my house and come to the island, and I am glad I'm here. Yes. That is the best place and blessed. It's, you know, rainy. I say, thank God it's not five feet snow. <laughs> <laughs> this is happening. Oh. Yeah. Oh. 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 My mama was like a horse. She worked really hard in Russia. Very, very hard. Yes. And I can tell you, ladies, here is my mama. She has only dress. She never had underwear or bra. There is nothing in the store. No. And then, in 1967, I go see her. See my family. I don't see it for 27 years. Oh. Yeah. Who are they, Rosa? Who are they? That's my uh, two brothers and two sisters and my mama. They're all gone. I have here? only left younger brother in the white Russia. Were any of your brothers and sisters in the slave camps too? No. Just you? Yeah. They were older and married and uh, the younger, uh, the sister that's older than I, five years she was pregnant. So I'm the one uh, good for the world. <laughs> So, and I am, uh, I'm glad in America. So I'm 87, I'm gonna live.